Hey everyone, so we are back uh, just a couple of minutes behind <laughs> when we planned, um, but I am really delighted to have a member of our scientific advisory council and uh, the man who is a scientific director at Abbott Labs, uh, Norman Moore, and he's going to be presenting on um, sort of beyond C. diff, the impact of antibiotics on other parts of our body, um, and I'm really excited to have him with us. So. Um, you know, again, if you have questions during his presentation, feel free to put them in the chat and we will gather them up and we'll ask Norman at the end. So with that, I'm going to pop off the camera and leave it to you, Norman. Awesome. So thank you very much. I mean, my hope is to give something that's a little bit controversial, a little bit fun, because one of the great worries is that, you know, everybody just keeps getting antibiotics and, you know, we've done that our parents have done that, our grandparents have done that. And now when you talk to the CDC, one of the great threats, even under this big COVID outbreak is just the basic bacteria that can still cause problems. So my hope here is to kind of show you this bigger picture of what we have going on and hopefully that'll work. So I'm going to now reduce, show my screen. So great threats of humankind. One of the big ones out there, again, is antibiotic resistance. When you think about all of these crazy things out there with global warming and the wars and all the things that we fight, antibiotic resistance is one of the top things that we care about. So we talk about antibiotic resistance just to kind of throw a few numbers out there. You know, here we are. We're used to getting antibiotics. You go to a hospital and, you know, sometimes they're so unnecessary, redundant. We give antibiotics for things like, you know, the person's feeling nauseous or maybe they're, you know, a broken leg. And yet all of these things that may not be caused by the bacteria and quite often we still give them anyway, and just to kind of catch up right now, you know, a lot of these things are unnecessary or redundant. And one of the big things out there, just to make sure people are aware is when you give antibiotics, you're not killing just the bad bacteria, but you're killing the good ones as well. And even when you, with those good ones that are left, you're actually kind of teaching them to be resistant. And so when you keep giving antibiotics, these bacteria that are left there have these little plasmids and they like, you know, know how to become resistant. And the issue with that is you can actually give that to a bad bacteria, a pathogen later on. So the more and more we give these antibiotics out, the more we're teaching that to become resistant. And that way you really kind of are taking that off as a drug of choice later on. So the whole idea here is the whole idea of test target treat is you don't want to use a bazooka kill the bug. You want to do something a lot more effective to make sure that we get it. And just to kind of throw out there, we get it in a lot of different ways. And one of the crazy things out there is where these bacteria, come, these antibiotics come from. Believe it or not, when we talk about our animal feed, we're actually getting in about a lot of the vast majority of the antibiotics made in this country actually go into our animal feed. And that's kind of a crazy thing, but we are actually shown that the more you give antibiotics to animals, the fatter they get, the fatter they get, the more money they make. So we at least now have this, you know, pushback that we're starting to do a little bit more organic because feeding these animals all these antibiotics, we don't even know what scientifically it means fully because, of course, these animals are pooping and it's you know, the, these resistant microorganisms are getting into our water. And there's a lot of other crazy things that go on here. So I, again, I don't mind when we give it if the animal sick. Absolutely, give them antibiotics. You know, if somebody's another animal's been exposed. But again, these non-therapeutic means. If they're not sick, let's not give them the antibiotics. I won't even go into the meat. But the whole here idea here is when we talk about this antibiotic resistance, we expect by the year 2050 these resistant bacteria are going to be killing more people in the United States than cancer and diabetes combined. And that's why we're so worried about resistance. Um, and again, I'm going to skip over a few sides to make up a little bit of time, but just to kind of say the more antibiotics we take, the more we actually find resistance to them later on. So let's go into this microbiome. Let's go into this brand new idea. And the whole idea of a microbiome is depending on the, 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 the literature you see, if I look at a person, roughly 90% of the cells in a person are actually bacteria. And only 10% of you are you. Now, your cells are much bigger, so you're more you by weight. But by number, the bacteria actually outnumber us almost like 10 to 1. And so, you know, we got these microbes. They're bacteria. They're fungi. We make up this giant community. I won't talk about biofilms to make up some time. But just to say, all over our body, we've got different environments. We've got, you know, moisture areas under our armpits and our groin. And certain bacteria love those areas. Some uh, bacteria love the oily parts on our face. And because of that, we have all different parts of bacteria in different areas. 
So again, here we are, we're outnumbered. You know, we got 10 trillion of our cells to 100 trillion of the bacteria. You know, we've only got about 20,000 genes. Well, they got about 9 million. And they're now finding out that the genes and bacteria can actually impact our own genes. So, you know, how do we get this microbiome? Well, you know, uh, in a womb, the baby's supposed to be sterile. Um, and we're finding out when the baby is being born, they're going to be exposed to these bacteria in their vaginal, fecal, skin. Um, and also breastfeeding is going to actually help introduce um, our gut, you know, to having the right type of bacteria in there. And so we are finding out right now that it can be um, disrupted a little bit when you're bottle feeding or we're giving these kids these antibiotics left and right. Um, that can kind of have an impact on how their gut gets uh, fully populated with the right type of bacteria. So I won't even go into all the different species in our gut and how much because not that I want to get into it too much, but, you know, a lot of the smell of your uh, poop is actually bacteria that are being lice. So that's, uh, again, what it is. But just to kind of say, and I won't get too, too scientific, just to even kind of show that the microbiome has these ways of even educating our own immune system. And I think that's one of the big things here to understand is the bacteria that normally live in our body want us to be healthy. We are the ship. If the ship goes down, they're going down with it. So we have evolved to actually have this wonderful relationship with a lot of our bacteria. So again, I'm not going to go too into it too much for time, but just to kind of show that some of these bacteria can actually help our own inflammatory system to make sure that we make the right type of cells that can help, again, protect us. So it's this relationship is extraordinarily important. And yes, they do the things like they help us digest food. They make vitamins for us. You know, they'll vary for pathogens. I want to mention a little bit about C. diff uh, because, again, the bacteria that normally live in your gut do not want C. difficile around. If C. difficile is around, they can kill the host, and that's what they don't want. So all of those things impact us to make sure we understand we need the bacteria in us. If we don't have the bacteria, we don't survive. Um, and even kind of showing this gut diversity right now, you know, they've even kind of shown that, you know, they went to this one place in Africa where these kids had never, ever even gotten a bacteria, an antibiotic before in their entire life. One dose of antibiotics one time actually changed their gut flora, which was pretty amazing that just that little bit is enough to change it. And we do see right now that different countries kind of have different bacteria because we have different ways of eating. Um, I will say this, we in the United States, in our Western diet, do not eat well. So we tend to select the bacteria that love sugar in their diet. And so we will select against that. So if we have people that emigrate from one part of the world to us, they tend to have their own gut Americanized as our, our bad food issues can actually knock out their own bacteria and all of a sudden they can get more of the American sort of thing. So let's talk about some weird diseases, and we're going to get, get into the bigger ones out there. So acne, believe it or not, is actually quite often caused by particular bacteria that grow when all of a sudden these teenagers, you know, get into that age where they're just producing crazy amounts of oil in their skin. Um, we're seeing a lot of issues with um, dental. You know, if you've got really, you know, if you don't take care of your teeth very well, the bacteria can actually grow up, you know, and, and cause issues there. And one of the crazy issues with the oral flora, you know, that the oral bacteria that cause problems, there's now been links to how we treat our teeth is how uh, our actual heart is being affected. So there's actually now correlations with take care of your teeth and maybe you even have less heart problems later on. I won't worry about the bacteria. We know this is why we're here, C. diff. Again, the whole background of this is how important C. diff is as a disease. If you've got a healthy gut flora, the whole issue right now is quite often, if you're exposed to these spores, these spores will pass right through you and really not cause disease. It's when you take those antibiotics right up front that it wipes out the normal protective layer of our bacteria, and that's where we have the issue. So here's our, our gut flora. It's all protected in there. We wipe it out. That's when the spores come in. If people don't like that, here's my little issue. You got the beach. The beach is populated with all the people, not these days with COVID, but there's that beach. You take the antibiotics, all of a sudden the beach is open. That's when C. diff can come in and that's when C. diff can take over and really kind of cause problems. Um, I'm not going to go into community associated for lack of time right now, but unfortunately with how many antibiotics we take, 
we actually are seeing a bit more of times where rather than just the hospital, maybe you've taken antibiotics and so you're not even in the hospital, but again, that antibiotics can still lead to cases of C. difficile. And sometimes when we're not in the hospital, we're seeing that um, it tends to be a little bit younger um, when it's not in the hospital and it tends to be a bit more women than men. And there are reasons potentially for that. Maybe the ba basic reason for why women more than men is um, quite often women, to no surprise to most of the audience out there, are actually better at taking care of themselves than men are. So if there's an issue, women tend to seek medical treatment, whereas men don't as well. So let's go into some of the crazy things out there right now and all the other things that are being caused when we abuse antibiotics, not just C. diff, but what are the things out there? The hygiene hypothesis. Let's first talk about that. If I want a good muscular system, what should I do? I should go out there and I should exercise. If I want a good immune system, I should actually go out there, play in the dirt, you know, be exposed to things, especially when I'm a kid, and that will help me build a nice, happy, happy, healthy immune system. So the whole idea of this hygiene hypothesis right now is if you're having your kid live in a bubble, they're never exposed to anything, you boil anything that touches the ground, all of that, we're seeing this whole thing of allergies and asthmas are exposing, and they are now suggesting that these allergies and asthma and things are exploding because our immune systems really aren't normally developing like they, they should be. I won't go through the mechanisms too much, but just to kind of show that out there for later on, the whole point of this immune system is it is crazy complex. Everything is connected to everything else. So God forbid I would ever do that to you people to try to even try to explain this side, but just to kind of show it is wildly, people can spend their entire careers just studying that one slide right here. Just to kind of say, when I was a kid, you didn't hear about things like peanut allergies. That wasn't the thing. So what has changed all this time that all of a sudden, you know, if I go out there and I'm talking to an audience and they're, I don't want to say older and get myself in trouble with that. But when you've got an older population, nobody had a peanut allergy. Nobody was seeing these things. And now, of course, we're being exposed to that. So, you know, we are seeing that if you've got a lot of uh, siblings, you tend to have less allergies. If you are, you know, exposed on a farm, things like that, you tend to have less allergies as opposed to if you're an only child, quite often you you are going to get a bit more. Here's that peanut allergy thing that I've been talking about that all of a sudden there's been a growth. There's got to be a reason for that. And they're looking at the hygiene hypothesis as part of that. Asthma has been growing. Again, it's a little bit complicated, but I won't go over that. Here's some weird things. Let's talk about obesity. Uh, obesity, well, it can be part diet, obviously. Uh, in action, God knows a lot of these kids uh, will play video games straight through. So these kids we have been preparing for COVID all their lives, and they are ready to be in an environment where they don't have to do anything and speak to anybody. So I'm making a little joke there, genetics, but now they're seeing this microbiome as part of it. And so I won't go through all the experiments again for time, but they're now actually showing that a thin mouse and a mouse that has weight, a mouse that's obese, actually have different bacteria in their gut. And so they've done these crazy experiments where they can actually take the bacteria from a, the gut from an obese mouse and you put into the germ-free mouse and the germ-free mouse, you know, doesn't change their diet, doesn't change their way they exercise. And it just right there, boom, that mouse will actually gain weight just from changing the gut flora. And I will say this, when I've gone out there and you know, I've given talks on things like C. diff and talking about some of these changes, there's a few cases out there where people have actually gained weight after having a fecal transplant if it has come from an overweight person. They've actually done some experiments with people too. Not that we put bacteria into people, we can't do that. But when they've taken these twins, you know, like obese, thin, and they put these uh, bacteria into mice, again, these mice can gain weight or lose weight depending on the microbiome of that as well. So again, I won't go through all of this, but just to say, uh, if you think that the answer is, if I just take a pill of bacteria and I'm going to lose weight, it doesn't work that well. It's not that easy because if you have a nice diverse microflora and you starve them out by still having just pizza and Coke, you're still not going to be able to support those bacteria, those more healthy bacteria to make sure that we do the right thing. So again, 
we do know, and the science is actually pretty now darn strong on how the bacteria we have will actually help us gain or lose that weight. So that is on the more established side. So again, I won't worry too, too much more about that for lack of time. But just again to say, it's something that really is, is strongly now found. Um, uh, we've even seen sometimes infant exposure. When you expose some of these kids to antibiotics, sometimes they may gain weight a little bit later on. Uh, those are some of the things going out there. We've talked a little bit about some of this when you establish that gut microbiome in these kids. There are actually some studies being gone doing on now to say, okay, what do we do about this? What happens when we um, um, formula feed or have C-sections? And what they're trying to do now is say, okay, what if we swab the vagina, put that in the baby's mouth and start establishing things that way. So there are some experiments going on to try to help with that to make sure that it is well, more well-established. Um, I'm going to say a word about prebiotics and probiotics because these are now in our general lexicon. You know, people are talking about these healthy probiotics that we're taking. Um, a probiotic is the bacteria themselves. So if I'm sitting there eating yog yogurt, one of the things I'm doing is I'm actually eating a thing called lactobacillus. And I am helping populate my gut with that particular healthy bacteria. Um, what a prebiotic is, is it's food for our bacteria. And so now you can actually have pills now to take the bacteria, that food source for the bacteria. And if people don't think that that's important, they have now shown that women, when they're making breast milk, specifically make prebiotics to feed not only the baby, but the bacteria in that baby. So these prebiotics are so important that we have evolved to make it. We've evolved to have our breast milk um, supplying and helping those bacteria grow up and populate and do the right thing. So it's that important out there. And, and of course, with, you know, weight gain, there's a lot of things that are connected. I won't go through that as well. Let's go into something that's a bit more controversial. Um, we do know that there are some types of cancer that are actually caused by um, microbes. You know, the more one that people think about is cervical cancer is actually caused by a thing called human papillomavirus. I won't go through the, all of the other types. Hepatitis might be causing liver cancer. But again, this is a bit more controversial. But they've been looking at, are there links between breast cancer and the microbiome? And so here's one of the controversial topics in there. We do know that breast tissue, like every other tissue, has its own microbiomes. That's all the slide is meant to say. Of course, <clears throat> that microbiome does get established. How does the bacteria get there? Well, it goes right through the skin to the nipple areola orifice. It can be there by the hands, translocation from the gut. It can be oral, breastfeeding, sexual. All of those things can play into getting bacteria in. Again, it has its own environment. I won't go through the statistics of breast cancer. It is so high right now that I, I don't know very, very many people that don't know a person that's um, that, that hasn't had that experience in their family, in their friends. So again, the risk of that, I will just say right now, again, this being one of the bit more controversial, they are now with some of these studies linking this and saying, okay, what may be happening out there with this, all of this crazy breast tissue is that maybe there are these, some of these bacteria they're secreting what's called a virulence factor. And the virulence factor is leading to what's called a pro-inflammatory environment. And they are now looking at whether maybe this microbiome shift is potentially pot promoting carcinogenesis. Is something like this happening? Again, this is a bit more of the controversial slide, but this is something that is actively being looked at right now. And so the question is, if it can cause it, um, could we change it? And so, again, experiments are underway, and we have actually seen right now they're looking at different bacteria with colorectal cancer. But this may be something for the future is changing the bacteria that live within us to potentially get different outcomes out there. All right, here's a weird one, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, uh, it can affect joints, hands, wrists, all that sort of thing. Um, what they're now seeing right now is um, some of these bacteria are now more associated with arthritis. And so what's the crazy evidence for this? 
Well, they had these mice that had these mutations that make them more increased risk of arthritis if they're in those sterile conditions. So here they are, if they're kept in a sterile condition, they're fine, they're happy, they're healthy, they don't get arthritis. You take them out of that sterile condition and all of a sudden they're exposed to other bacteria. And if they're exposed to those certain species, all of a sudden then they get joint pain. So there's a little issue there. Autism. This is really one of the more controversial ones out there. I'm going to skip ahead by saying this. If I look at an autistic child versus a non-autistic child, they do generally have different microbiomes. If I look at the bacteria in one person's gut versus another, autistic ch children tend to have something different. <clears throat> but it may be different because they eat more select foods. So if they're more on a stricter diet, that may be the thing that is, is causing these differences. So this is a one of those things with microbiome that has really gone very much back and forth through the years. So, you know, probably five years ago, uh, talking to NIH, they really looked at some of this autistic data with the microbiome and thought that there was not a link. Um, there have been brand new papers in the last year that they is now shifting it back. So this is one of those things that we're going to have to wait and see whether there are autistic links or not with the microbiome. Again, we know that there is different differences between that. There is some data out there, but is there a true link? We're going to see. We're going to wait and see on that. So again, that's my 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 take home on that is it's too early to tell, but it again is an active area of research. Behavior. Can bacteria in our gut? change our behavior. Now, I will say this, one of the big examples out there, Toxoplasma gondii is um, a thing that has been known to change behavior. Um, it tends to live in cats and it can accidentally infect. We really worry about uh, pregnant women because it can cause uh, problems with the fetus if the woman's pregnant while this. That's why we don't want pregnant women changing the litter box. Um, 27 years ago, my wife got pregnant. I started changing the litter box then. It's been 27 years. She is no longer pregnant, but it has still been my job. Um, but just to say right now, what they've seen out there with this, and this sounds kind of crazy, is this toxoplasma. We'll get into mice. And what it does is it actually changes their brain. And it changes their brain to say, okay, don't be afraid of the odor of cats. And so because now these mice are not as afraid of cats, they can now actually, when the, when that that usually if they smell like you know cat urine, they're out of that house. They don't want to be anywhere near that house because they're going to be eaten. Now with this, they are more likely to be around a cat. And again, this bacteria makes them more likely to be eaten, so that it then goes through that life cycle there. And believe it or not, they've actually shown that. Um, and again, this is some weird studies early on that. Toxoplasma gondii has been linked to more high risk behaviors in people. Um, it's really hard to fully control those types of studies, you know, um, so take that with a grain of salt. But again, there are publications saying that if toxoplasma is in a person, they are more likely, again, to be exposed to high risk things. I will say this as a crazy little side there is now even a suggestion in one paper a few years back that. Not only does it make these um, mice not afraid of cats, it may actually make them, this sounds very bizarre, slightly attracted to cats in a sexual manner. So it actually seeks out cats so that it's more likely to be eaten. Totally bizarre study. Um, but of course, the whole thing is if these bacteria can affect other brains, can it affect ours? And I will say this, they have shown if I give just low dose penicillin, which how many kids today are being exposed to penicillin? If I give that to mice, they have actually shown that those mice will actually have changes in their behavior. Low-dose penicillin has been linked to these anxiety-like uh, disorders. And I will say that we have an explosion of anxiety um, disorders in kids today. And a lot of that is based on social media. But they're now saying, well, is some of this even with our own microbiome? Um, Here's a couple things. Other mice raised in sterile environments with no microbiome risk taking, they tend to wander into environment. Um, I, I won't go into this too much, but just to say um, they don't do well 
with uh, memory. And so they're now showing that, you know, if I take two objects and I put them in front of that mouse for five minutes and I remove one object for 20 minutes and then I put the, uh, the objects back, the mouse with a microbiome, believe it or not, says, OK, I remember that object from 20 minutes ago. So, I, I, you know, I'm OK with that. Whereas the other mouse that hasn't been exposed to that, that doesn't have its own microbiome, its memory is impaired, which sounds totally bizarre. But there has been a link with our microbiome and how we remember things. It has been shown to change behavior. So here we have another experiment. We have two mice groups. One mouse group is very anxious. Uh, one group is uh, more social, more extrovert. And what they did is they took these mice and they said, okay, I'm going to put them on a platform. And an anxious mouse will sit there, look down the platform. And quite often it took four to five minutes to finally say, okay, I'm going to get down from this platform. Boom, 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 get down. When they changed the gut flora, same mouse, but changed the gut flora in that mouse, all of a sudden that anxious mouse wasn't as afraid anymore, and they would actually get down from that platform faster. They did the same thing with the other way with an extrovert. The extrovert just would you put them up on the little platform. It would just jump down on its own. When you change the microbiome in that mouse, all of a sudden the extrovert started being a little bit more cautious. And again, these are mouse studies, but the mouse's brain isn't so, so, so wildly different from than the human that we would associate that we probably have behavior changes too when it comes to our microbiome. Um, here's an odd one that has um, uh, a kind of a backwards approach to it. There's a thing called pandas, and we're not talking about that black and white cute little animal at the zoos. Um, what they're now seeing with some of this is there are people, there are these kids that actually develop these crazy hyperimmune responses when they get strep A. So that you know that that when you get a strep throat, that's caused by a thing called group A streptococcus. What we're now seeing with some of these kids is they now will actually have, when they get strep A rather than the traditional sore throat, these kids all of a sudden will have phobias. So they're now they're you know afraid of certain things. They 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 some of them have tick disorders where they can't move very well. Some of them just just have these emotional outbursts. And if you go on YouTube and look at pandas and look at this, you'll see these crazy videos of these kids where all of a sudden they were behaving normally and all of a sudden maybe they were beautiful artists and all of a sudden they get strep a their body mounts this crazy immune response and all of a sudden they only can draw stick figures it's just the most amazing thing and now actually with these kids you can actually cure their behavior with antibiotics so there's that out there so i won't go through that too much um micro mutant hypothesis let's go through another weird one out there i told you that the bacteria love to keep you healthy. Fantastic, that's true. But what happens when you get old? Um, if the ship starts getting a few little holes in it, maybe it's time for them to leave. And so the whole idea here is um, if you're starting to get to the point where you're getting a little bit more elderly, um, maybe these bacteria are going to start to turn on you a little bit. And so just to kind of give you examples, you know, uh, unfortunately, when you're elderly, you get tend to get a bit more diarrhea, and maybe that's the bacteria's way of saying, you know what, when it's diarrhea, it's really easy to transmit to other people. Maybe this is my way of getting out and getting to, into other people as well. Um, right now, we hear of, um, we just have COVID going on right now. I will say, you know, usually with flu, um, when you die of flu, quite often you actually die of a secondary pneumonia. And there's a thing called streptococcus pneumonia that lives quite often happy and healthy in a person's upper nose. And all of a sudden, you know, it may actually, when a person has the flu and they say, oh, my God, the bacteria will say, if this person dies, I'm going to be in trouble. It'll turn on its genes to make the person sick. It'll go in and it'll make you start coughing so it can transmit to other people. So it'll actually potentially give you pneumonia. So it can transmit to other people just in case you are going to die. So it's another evil, weird thing out there with this. These crazy non-human microbiome issues. We're actually seeing one of the great threats out there right now is bees. And we're trying to understand what to do because we are in deep, deep, deep trouble if we lose the bees. So, you know, we had this issue where, you know, quite often antibiotics are used to prevent bacterial infections. So here we are trying to give antibiotics, and unfortunately, what one of the concerns is, um, if we they give them antibiotics, they lose their normal flora, 
And so they've done these experiments where antibiotics did lead to a decrease in the survivorship because just like things like C. diff, if all of a sudden these bad opportunistic bacteria pathogens come in, now they can take up residence. And so we actually may potentially do some harm if we give too many antibiotics because, again, when we decolonize anything, it allows the pathogens to come in. And of course, with this group right now, C. diff is the prime example. Just to say it again, if you have a healthy gut flora, that is the safest thing you can do or one of the safest things you can do to prevent you from having C. diff. It's when we take those antibiotics that we have to really be careful with the, that patient population to make sure that they're not exposed to these C. diff spores that are so, so hardy. Health benefits. Again, we're seeing some, they're looking at some fecal transplants for HIV to see if they can help HIV populations. I won't go into that too much. Um, HIV has been one of the fantastic success stories over the years. We are now seeing with HIV with some of the new medications right now that um, the life expectancy is doing fantastic. You know, we're now seeing to the point where people can now have kids in unprotected sex because uh, without the ability to transmit the virus because the viral load is so low. So there's wonderful success stories there. Crazy side benefits. We talked about the probiotics a bit. People have known about the benefits of probiotics all the way back to, back to Egyptian times. So you can actually see, even back on the hieroglyphics, the importance of the microbiome, the importance of having that fermented milk for your normal, happy, healthy life. And we've been looking at this. We looked at fermented milk products since the 1800s. We looked at the benefits of yogurt since the 1930s. And so they're now looking at probiotics much more heavily on a lot of these other issues right now. I will say that there are probiotic pills that you can buy in the uh, like GNC health stores and all that. There is a little bit of caution. Some of those companies out there aren't too ethical. And I've actually seen some companies that will sell you dead bacteria. So if you take a pill of dead bacteria, you're not doing yourself any good whatsoever. So if you're looking at probiotics, at least look and see if it has an expiry in the bottle. Because if it doesn't have an expiry, I don't know how you keep bacteria alive that long. So I at least tend to go for the things that are, again, with an expiry label and maybe refrigerated, maybe a little bit safer. Again, there's a lot more information coming out on probiotics as we speak. All right, here's a weird one. I think I'd throw this in here for this group. Hygiene. I will say this, Listerine. It started off as a floor cleaner. Um, and they decided, well, you know, we're not selling nearly enough Listerine, so what are we going to do? And they're actually the ones that came up with the word halitosis. They wanted to come up with some scientific sounded name, like it was some disease. And that's what they did. And it actually worked great that, you know, they had these you know, com big commercials on this. And when I was a kid, one of the things that you were supposed to do to see if you had bad breath is you'd actually cup your hands, you breathe into your hands and then, then smell. And of course, you're just smelling your hands right there. But darn it, it actually worked very, very well. And it really made Listerine one of the big sellers right now. And we're now starting to wonder, well, you know, if you've got gum disease, maybe that's a good thing. But you know, how helpful, how how good is it to keep wiping out the bacteria in your mouth? Is that a good thing, really? Bathing. Um, we used to do it once a week. Um, I will say this. The expression, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Why do we ever have that expression? Well, way back when, back in the 1920s or whatever, you do one bath on a Sunday. Dad would take the first bath. Mom would take the second bath in the same water older kid and it would all the way get down to the younger ones and of course by the time the baby came along the water quite often was pretty murky and so that's where the expression came out with is, is the if the water was that murky you want to make sure the baby wasn't in there still before you kind of threw that water out so here we are we used to do, do bathe once a week and you know again we had a massive massive ad campaign by these soap companies to say you know what you really need to shower every single day and what we've seen with that is we've now really kind of wiped off the normal flora from our skin. And so here we are wiping off that normal flora, and now we're having our skin dry out. And really, when you look at it scientifically, you don't need to bathe every day. Yes, I still do. Don't start any rumors out there that I'm not bathing every day. But when you really look at it, you know, just 
you know, armpit and groin probably is going to be good enough for you out there. And so what we're even seeing right now is um, here we are. All of these companies have told us we have to shower every day. What are they doing now? Well, they're now selling us all the lotions to then re-moisturize our skin. Here's a crazy one. There's actually this company out there that is now putting bacteria onto our body rather than having a shower. So this AO biome I saw there is selling a mist that has this bacteria called Nitrosomonas eutropha <clears throat> that the whole idea is if you spray it on, you don't need to at that point bathe. And so believe it or not, when I look this up, that inventor at MIT hasn't showered in 12 years. I won't say anything about people from MIT that will get me in serious trouble right now. And, of course, that doesn't mean that it's working, that he hasn't showered, but it does show dedication at least. Um, but, again, what's happening right now is L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, Clique, they're all now looking at patenting probiotics. So they've all gone from – taking all the bacteria away to now adding it back. So things are coming full circle. And so the whole point with all this, and I'll kind of end this way to say, listen, that's why we don't want to go in there. If you are a parent, don't go in and just demand antibiotics. If it is a cold, a sniffle, quite often a lot of these colds are viral in nature. So when we take these antibiotics, when we don't need it, you potentially take that off as a, as a, treatment choice later on so we want to be as safe as possible and really let them go as long as possible we don't have a big pipeline of new antibiotics so we have to be very judicious with what we have left make sure that we truly understand because if we don't we really are going to be in an area where you know what happens when there's a, a scratch knee what, what happens when there's some things that we get these you know, and by these bacteria that are serious enough. We actually had, I think it was probably a year and a half ago, we found, uh, I think there was one E. coli that was resistant to all known antibiotics. And so there are bigger and bigger concerns out there. There was a thing called Canada um, auris that is a fungi that they were so afraid in the hospital that once that patient left, they ripped out all of the ceiling tiles and all the floor tiles just to make sure that they weren't going to have that transmitted. So, there's a lot of whole ideas of why we want to test people to make sure we give them the right thing because, again, the whole big issue still comes down to antibiotics that we want to make sure that we have these antibiotics when we truly need it. That's why we want to make sure we test. That's why we want to make sure we don't do things the right way. And so the whole future of the microbiology laboratory, the whole future of all this is to make sure, again, know what you have. When I'm talking to a hospital laboratory they are front lines. We want to make sure that we get the right results. But on the flip side of that, that means we have to be good patients. We, how many people out there doctor shop? If they don't get an antibiotic, when they wanted an antibiotic, they'll stop going to that doctor and go to another doctor that does give them what they want. We've got to be a lot better than that. We've got to be a lot better and make sure that we really understand what's causing our illness. And if it's just a virus, live with it. It's going to get better all on its own. If it's a kid, 70% of the time, it's going to get better all on its own. Even if you don't give an antibiotic, if it's just a virus, live with it. It's going to get better all on its own. So I think I've been able to catch up pretty darn well. So my hope right now is I still have time for a few questions, and I would love to open it up for those questions. So Susan O'Brien asks, um, are there any particular strains of probiotics uh, that you prefer? I am not good enough, and I don't want to endorse the company right now, but all I've seen is the more diverse, the better. The more bacteria we have, if I look at all those experiments with the mice, the more types of strains I had really seemed to be a, a great thing. So uh, I'm going to avoid that one. But just to say, if you're taking probiotics, um, you still, again, have to eat healthy. You can't just take the bacteria and think you're going to have a miracle cure. Well, that's disappointing. Um, <laughs> uh, so then Kimberly Rice asked, is kefir considered a good source of probiotic for uh for those sensitive to them? I am not a dietitian, so I, I've got a PhD rather than MD, so I'm trying to get myself not in trouble by endorsing something that could be an issue. So I'll 
I, I'm over two right now on questions. I'm hoping I get the third one in there. But again, I'll, I'm on the science side. I can't endorse a certain probiotic. So. Okay. Spokes have any other questions for um, for Norman? You gonna let me over to anything I could answer that could help? I hope it was worthwhile just to try and give you the other side because again, when you think of all of the issues of the antibiotics, C. diff is really at the top of the list, and it, it's so terrifying. But hopefully. We all have to change. Doctors have to be less willing to give antibiotics when they don't need it. We have to be, again, more able to not demand that when we don't as well. So hopefully if we all work together, things will get better. Yeah, I agree. And I think that one of the things that I was mentioning in my presentation uh, earlier today was that we really need to help, um, we really need to help people become more literate about their health and how their bodies work. Because I think that, you know, besides maybe some health classes in high school, I don't think that we have a really good grounding in how our bodies work. Um, and so, all right, we got two more questions. Uh, so question, how has the landscape of testing for gut pathogens changed? People are now spending a lot of money to send that away. But I think right now the data on that is still too early because what does that mean? Um, so. Yeah, there, there there are some companies trying that, but I, I hate to even endorse anything like that because I, I really like to look at publications to make sure that we're not just spending our money and it's not really doing any good. Because right now, if you're if you're happy, you're healthy, you're doing something right right there. Um, but I will say on the flip side, if you are a parent, I do like the idea that we don't sterilize everything. I do like the idea that you allow them to go play outside and roll around. And if they're eating a little dirt, that's not going to be the worst thing for them either. I really, from everything I've seen, I think it is helpful to have them be exposed. I, I, even with common colds, you know, you get four to six colds when you're a kid. And by the time you're an adult, you usually only get one or two. It's because we've been exposed to all these things all our life. So we build up that natural immunity, which is not a bad thing. Yeah, it's George Carlin, the comedian, had, uh, used to have a whole spiel about how, you know, when he was younger, they used to go swimming in the Hudson River, and so they were immune to everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we go to Mexico, we drop dead because of all the things that we get down there. So, yeah, it's um, we we Americans are very fragile when we start do some of our travel. Um, I had to go to India, and I only ate packaged things. I wouldn't even brush my teeth in the water in the sink because... Yeah, we're just not used to it. Um, nope. So Spencer asked, how do you keep mice in an environment with no microbiome? Uh, that is, I mean, obviously you have air pumped in and you've got the nice little cages up there, but um, we actually can, I, I don't personally, but there are ways to do a sterile microbiome. Um, I can look up a little bit more, but yeah, no, you, they are in separate cages and they have, I don't know how you cook the food to keep that sterile, but um God knows there's a whole probably science to that too. God, you guys are asking some tough questions. Those, I usually don't get that. When I'm out in, in these medical labs, they're not asking me any of that. Um, so, and then Helen asked, and if you don't feel expanding upon it, that would be fine too. But she was mentioning that um, autism, you know, you say that autism could possibly be affected by the microbiome or, or the microbiome yep. may play a role. Yep. It is controversial, but there have been a few more articles that have been in the, out the last few years that have pushed it back. The last time I talked to NIH, they were very skeptical about it, but I haven't talked to NIH after the other bigger articles came. So it is a huge area of controversy. I'm curious to see where it goes the next few years, but there is some data saying that it may play a role. And it does confuse things because we've changed the definition of what is autistic. So sometimes because the definition has changed, we, um, and they're not to cause trouble, but they're not linked to vaccines. That we know. There have been study after study. If I get in trouble for that, that's okay. We know that autism and vaccines, no link. So, um, so two more questions. Thanks. We have a really good group staying, hanging in with us, uh, even though we're past the time. Um, so 
personal disclosure. Uh, so I was hospitalized for scarlet fever when I was six. Uh, and then when I was in college, I was diagnosed with OCD and I have been living with OCD my entire life. Um, so that I, long before we did anything to do with C. diff, uh, I had researched into looking into pandas because of my own history. Mm -hmm. I had scarlet fever. And you know, the, at that point it may have changed but the controversy then was, is the strep, the risk is the strep itself, you know, in the sort of body's immune response, or is it the antibiotics? Because they used to use tricyclics back then, um, which we don't really use as much anymore. So, uh, so that's just a little behind the scenes of your your fair executive director here. <laughs> Trying to think of my poor mother being twenty five years old and having a kid that they thought they thought at one point that I had Kawasaki syndrome and I was going to die. So it was like the poor thing. Um, so Gerard asks, um, is the clinical testing technology improving to the point where it will be routine to identify or rule out bacterial causes of symptoms in a typical outpatient setting? Yes. Uh, yes. The, the, a ton of companies, including the one I work for, are, everything is going more toward the patient. The things are, yeah, there is all new technologies and things are getting closer and closer. So will we ever get in the home? Maybe we will. Um, but Yes, right now there's a lot more tests that if you go, you know, besides the usual strep and flu, yes, the more in, in the future you're going to be able to detect more and more there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean a lot of I mean a lot of advocates who work in sort of healthcare associated infections issues that I know or people that work on on sepsis, they are kind of desperate for a much more rapid test to say, like, is this bacteria? Is it viral? Like, you know, how do we handle this? Do we need to go to the hospital? And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, if we could figure a way to empower patients that way, that would be really useful. Um, so I think maybe the last question, um, question, do you think pandas can be cured by good gut health? I know a child with it on constant antibiotics and then they develop C. diff. Um, the problem with pandas is it's strep A and you get, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a hyperimmune response. It's C strep A and does that. So there is a possibility because, again, what you want to make sure is you give that person something so that strep A doesn't colonize. Um, and, of course, you have to watch out for the siblings, too, because... You know, if if you don't if you've got a cure from the kid and the the siblings are bringing home from school, that can be the issue. But yes, there is the possibility in the future that we can find better flora that protects you from getting strep A. So that is a possibility. Yep, it's still not done yet, but um, that is a way that we could go. Well, I mean, I think this was great. Uh, <laughs> besides, you you're in my technical difficulties. I had them this morning when we first started. Uh, but I think this was uh, a great and successful uh, first day of our summit. Uh, we have two more coming up. Norman, we appreciate you so much. Uh, we know you're very busy uh, these days with lots of questions from hospitals working on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we're very appreciative of your uh, taking your time for this. Um, and so we're going to <coughs> uh, close for the day and we will be back here at noon tomorrow.